Hey everyone, my name is Dan, and today I'll be talking to you about processors, past, present, and future. So the topics covered today, a uh, brief history of processors, I know we already went over some of it in junior phase, um, as well as today's modern processors. Um, in junior phase, I became pretty curious about how they engineer transistors so incredibly small near the atomic level. Um, so I delved into the manufacturing process of today's processors and also I'll be covering the future of processing um, which is very exciting. So this is an approximate, very approximate timeline of events. The first vacuum tube computers came into play in the early 1900s and they actually use the exact same logic gates and on-off um, binary that today's computers use. Um, with enough vacuum tubes and enough space and enough money, you could actually make something that does, um, you know, the calculations as, uh, as big as today's. In 1947, the first transistor is invented, and 1971 is when the first actual microprocessor uh, that we recognize as a processor came out. And um, a fun fact, oh, sorry. <laughs> Uh, fun fact about that first processor, it only contained 2,300 transistors total. It had about 600 bytes of memory, um, and it did about 60,000 calculations per second, which is still kind of a lot. Uh, and 1971 to present, um, this is kind of the modern era of processors. Uh, quantum computing, we've been hearing about a lot lately, but the field is really established by researchers uh, quite some time ago, starting in 1980. Um, 2014, D-Wave is confirmed as the first quantum computer, though this is kind of debated um, what it can actually do or not do. Um, and there's continued research and developments uh, by governments and universities in the quantum computing. Um, so a lot of resources are being poured over there. Um, so today's processor, how is it made? The raw material is actually sand. Um, and why is it sand? Because silicon, so th the material you end up with is silicon, but w which is actually incredibly common. It's actually the second most um, abundant material on the Earth's crust. But pure silicon is actually hard to come by. So sand it happens to be naturally rich in silicon. Um, so it's easily mineable, transportable to make a large amount of chips. Um, there are actually better semiconductor materials out there which could make better chips, but um, the additional cost of transporting those materials would make um, them impractical. Im impractical in terms of cost and also um, the marginal benefit would be pretty minimal. And what do they do with all that sand? So, they the first thing they do is they melt uh, the sand at very high temperatures and they extract the pure silicon out of it. And they put in a seed crystal into the silicon which creates this perfect square lattice crystal structure. And that's actually what um, enables the transistors to be so small. It, it's kind of based on top of this crystal structure. Um, and what you're left with uh, are these big circular tubes of pure silicon crystal called ingots and that's where they slice, th those things are sliced at a width of 0.5 millimeters up to 1.5 millimeters and that is the width of the actual chip you see. And the wafers are then uh, transferred to clean rooms. Uh, the clean rooms are incredibly clean, they're actually much more cleaner than um, even surgical operating rooms because any impurities of dust um, and any particles will destroy hundreds or thousands of transistors. So the rooms have to be incredibly clean. And these rooms are also extremely large. Um, the inside of them can be you know, as big as a Walmart or two soccer fields. Um, and the way they make the ridges in the chips, they actually have a pattern and they put UV light um, on the chips and they expose it to the pattern that they want. And the UV light makes the material soluble, and then they apply a solvent to it to kind of wash away um, the edge of the chip. And that makes these uh, neat little square edges um, that you can then fit all the incredibly small components into. And then they, um, 
they do what's called doping the silicon atom um, with phosphorus and boron, and that creates um, an atomic structure where there are either extra electrons or too few electrons. And um, the extra electrons want to travel to areas with fewer electrons, and that actually creates a very reliable um, way to um, uh, structure the electrical current when applied. And then finally, um, there, there are a lot more intermediary steps. This is a very bridge version, but um, more layers, layers of materials are applied, um, the transistors are formed, and then the transistors all, are all connected by extremely, extremely thin copper wiring, also as little as 10 nanometers in length. Um, and the design of the chip has obviously been carefully planned beforehand um, by a ton of designers, and then um, the copper is put into the design mold. And uh, interestingly now, chips rely heavily on computers to be made, which in turn rely heavily on chips to be made, so they kind of rely on each other to continue. And then finally, um, when the pattern is all done, the w you have a wafer of about in this picture, nine chips, but I think it's more usually. And uh, micro saws cut the chips um, into what you see as the actual chip. And then the chip is placed in a casing. And then um, an airtight cover is put on it. And then they're shipped to computer manufacturers. Um, and today, uh, the transistor size is as small as 10 nanometers, which is just an incredible feat of engineering, I think, um, to build something that small and that reliable. And um, on to the future of processing, which we're going to take a left turn here. Um, so today in 2017, a big slowdown in Moore's Law is predicted. And Moore's Law is basically, Moore was the co-founder of Intel. And he basically predicted that processing power would double every year because they could reliably foresee that they could get transistor size smaller and smaller and smaller. And up until this point, they, they have. Um, however, Transistors are so small that any smaller the, um, the electrons don't behave reliably and they become governed more by quantum uncertainty. So it, it's, you can't reliably maintain the state of a transistor if it gets much smaller. Um, also, uh, the heat generation of uh, packing more, any more transistors in will make the chips overheat. Um, um, so what they've done, they've, they've added, in recent years, adding more processor cores. When you see dual core, quad core, octa core processors, that means more cores or simultaneous calculations. However, um, the mechanics of actually um, having these cores communicate with each other becomes very, very complex. So current solutions to, proce uh, to keep the processing moving faster and faster. There's a shift towards cloud computing, um, leveraging the millions of computers to process inc incredibly compl complicated things at once. Uh, they're looking into better materials, which generate less heat, um, like graphene-like compounds and other engineered compounds. And um, also just a shift tor towards other types of processing uh, at, or processing models, uh, one being neuromorphic computing mimicking human brain function, which uh, Jack mentioned, uh, neural net, um, making computer processors function more like uh, neurons. And lastly, quantum computing, which I'll get into briefly here. So quantum processors, though, I don't claim to understand all of this, um, as I don't have a PhD in physics. But um, the basic theory is that uh, Rather than bits, there are qubits. And qubits can hold more states than just a 1 or a 0. They can hold a lot of different states. Um, so given x number of qubits compared to bits, you can start, um, you can start um, processing in enormous amounts of unique states with not too many qubits. Um, and Challenge is controlling these states. Um, they're very unreliable um, at the moment. And, um, and also, it's been said more recently that this will be only useful for uh, specific niche applications. This is a graphical representation of Moore's Law. And there's a lot of interesting data on this slide. Uh, first thing to note is that 
sorry. It's a logarithmic scale, so this is not a linear scale. Um, you'll notice it starts at 10, goes up to 10 million. Um, so if this were a linear scale, it would be a very, very steep exponential curve. As you can see from 1971, the first modern processor, all the way up to present day, it's consistently doubled. Um, also, interestingly, the frequency um, or the clock speed has actually tapered off um, because we've hit a clock speed uh, ever since the early 2000s where if it's any higher, uh, the chip overheats. So when you see, when you go to buy a computer, you see gigahertz processors, uh, processor speed. That really hasn't changed much in the past 13 years or so. So that we're kind of hitting a flattening out there. Um, also, very interestingly, um, as you'll see, starting in the late 2000s, number of logical cores that has remained flat all the way up until about 10 years ago, and now is going up at an exponential rate. Um, and the implications of that, I will be discussing in the next few slides. So there are two types of processing. There are actually many types of processing, but um, two common ones are parallel processing and linear processing. The type of processing that computers do, and that computers are very good at, are linear processing. That's doing one calculation and then another one that relies on the result of the last calculation over and over and over again. Computers are amazing at that. However, humans are not good at that at all. Um, we could, if you ask someone to multiply 9 times 6 times 2 times 12 times whatever, you're only, you can, you're only capable of uh, linearly processing so fast. Um, however, the human brain is an excellent <coughs> parallel processor. Uh, we process, uh, I believe, billions of uh, pieces of information via sensory input, sight, taste, smell. We all have receptors to receive that in input simultaneously and make decisions based on it. Modern computers are not good at that at all. Um, however, with the um, exponential increase in processor cores, um, we will potentially be able to mimic sensory input. And if we com combine a machine with our sensory input capabilities plus their parallel um, linear processing capabilities, then uh, we could create something truly amazing or frightening. So. When you, <coughs> excuse me, when you combine the two, um, you could naively get something like data, a very friendly machine that's incredibly useful and can help humans out. Or you could also, if you've seen the movie Ex Machina, create something that will completely, manipula completely manipulate us and ultimately extinguish us. Um, so, I would say that those are two ends of the spectrum, and we have to be very careful with controlling uh, what types of intelligences we create. Because as you can see over the past 10 years or so, um, the, uh, the, the linear and parallel processing has begun to merge, and it's going to continue to merge. Um, and I'll leave you with some quotes from some uh, people in tech. So there are obviously some very smart people that are very concerned about the implications of where processing is going. Um, so this will be an exciting moral question to grapple with in our lifetimes. Um, and in conclusion, uh, we're in a time where Moore's Law, the phase of Moore's Law is kind of coming to an end, but that's by no means going to halt uh, our technological process at all. If anything, it's increasing. Uh, we have the opportunity to massively improve quality of life, or we have the opportunity to destroy our ourselves. And at least we are in very exciting times. <laughs> and these are my sources, and that is it. <laughs>